And I guess that kind of leads into, you know, to give people a little bit of context about, you know, kind of why I'm in this conversation mm -hmm. and my chapter in the book, if you like. I guess, you know, um, I started out in mission-driven organizations when I graduated. I ran a charity. And, um, you know, what, what I found was everybody was really passionate about the cause and therefore they would overcommit. You almost get some almost charity martyrdom. Mm. Uh, the cause is so good and great that we'll burn ourselves into the ground. And ever since that time, and, and the, the organization was very leadership focused. It was all about helping young people access and develop their leadership capabilities. And, you know, since that time, I've kind of built out a portfolio career. I've done corporate life. Uh, I've done some self-employment and now I, I, I do uh, organizational improvement work with a focus. And, and most I came at the mental toughness concept through that because I used to look at organizations and I just found some organizations easier to change than others. Some would be up for the challenge to get it and you kind of help them do the thinking and they'd be off. Others you'd help them do the thinking and then it it'd always be two steps, for, uh, two steps back, one step forward, two steps back, one step forward. And it was a real hard challenge. And that was kind of really how I got into mental toughness through that lens, looking at, you know, how can we help people do change more effectively? So it was quite a narrow way into the mental toughness concept, mm -hmm. um, you know, particularly around that lens of learning orientation and risk orientation within within the measure. Um, and, and that took me into a slightly different space i think to where most people were playing with the mental toughness questionnaire most people are using it on one-to-one -one coaching yeah kind of assignments where it does have real power but because i was looking at this at an organizational level and particularly around change projects i started using it quite quickly in that kind of organizational development space and you know it produced some really interesting insights and and through the book and, and my contribution to the book is a chapter about you know how I use the measure uh, to help organizations develop positive cultures and, and more progressive cultures, you know, and I, I work on the principle that mindset, um, yeah, a culture is a collective programming of the mind, if you like, yeah. you know, when people start yeah. working together, they start to build behaviors, common traits, common values, uh, and, and that is almost building a collective think. And some of that collective think will be really helpful uh, and we'll create really positive elements of the culture. But conversely, there will be elements of that group think that are, are not healthy for others uh, and become barriers to others almost to participate fully and effectively in that group. Um, you know, so I just use it as a bit of a tool to try and unpick that. It's almost making that invisible bit of the group think visible for people to reflect upon and think about, oh, could we do something different there? Should we do something different? um you know there's still an individual focus people still have to take responsibility but by looking at it in the group situation we can kind of help the team move forward and identify that's what where i really they're... liked about yeah what i really liked about your chapter was the way you talk about mental toughness and culture and i, I think that's what fascinates me that you've done a lot of work in this area about do you see individual and collective mental toughness affecting the culture or does the culture affect the mental toughness and the individuals which is does one come before the other? I don't know. Yeah, well, my view is relatively simple, I think. Look, the mental toughness questionnaire itself isn't a cultural measure. No. Uh, and therefore, I'd advise some caution before everybody runs off and thinks, oh, look, we've got a cultural <laughs> measure here. But yeah. what it does, it does give you an insight into that culture. And, you know, as I say, from my perspective, cult when people come together, as soon as people start working together, they will create their own subculture. And with yeah. an organization, you'll have multiple subcultures going on and you can hear it in the language. You can hear people kind of say, oh, yeah, I worked in that team, didn't really like it. I was never really mm. accepted. They kind of spoke mm. a different mm. language. And then they'll be in the same organization, but in another team and feel far more comfortable. Um, yeah. So I, I do think subcultures exist. Um, I think mental toughness is one of the shaping factors of the culture, um, you know, people's mindset. Um, but it's only one, you know, culture is, is multifaceted and really difficult to unpick. Um, yeah, loads of theory on it. You know, you've got things from symbols and artifacts and language. But behavior is definitely one of those big yeah. elements. Yeah. Um, you know, and, you know, to, to kind of I always say to people, it, it's like opening the top of your head up and shining a light on the thinking patterns. Um, you know, it, it's almost it can be scary visible. sometimes. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, it's reassuring people that, look, some of the thinking patterns that you have as an individual and as a group are helpful mm -hmm. and they'll be getting mm -hmm. great results. But we also need to accept every single one of us that some of those thinking patterns will be unhelpful for us. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. you know, if I always say to people, how many times? Yeah, you know, I always say to people, when you go to work, most of us live in that kind of hybrid world now and we've got our laptops. And every time you go into the office and plug it in, there's almost certainly IT will almost certainly do without you even knowing it, a little virus check on your hard drive before it connects it to the network to make sure there's nothing there that's damaging the net, the wider network. And, you know, we do that on our computer that we put on the desk, but how often do we do it with a computer that sits mm. in our head? You know, how Not often enough. do we scan yeah. it and say, you know, is there an unhelpful program running mm. that we, actually mm. if we could change it? We, that might get us a different result. Um, so, and, and what I think is really interesting, I think, yeah, we all know about team dynamics and how teams work together and individuals within teams working together. But what you can do, and what I often find, is when you start doing this at a group and team level, you can start to see where some of that conflict comes from between certain individuals or even why people just feel uncomfortable in teams. I mean, I, I often think, you know, if you've got a, a, a team that's got a interpersonal confidence score of around seven on average. So, you know, they're all probably going to be quite vocal. They're all relatively confident in their opinions. They're quite happy to have a little bit of conflict, um, you know, and you're a team member who's sitting in there with a, a score of a two against the average of a seven. This is going to feel a really direct, aggressive organization to you. And, you know, again, coming back to your words and the, the work of uh, Cass Stewart, you know, that context to go, look, the reason I'm finding this really difficult right now and I don't feel connected to this team is because you know, on interpersonal confidence, I'm a two. They're all much higher than me. And therefore, I've now got two choices or three choices. One is I can try and improve my interpersonal confidence and, and feel more part of this. Two, I just accept it and find ways and means to interact differently and more effectively with my colleagues and make sure I do get my voice in. Or ultimately, you know, this isn't a culture I, I can live with, I can be with. It, it doesn't sit comfortably with me, and therefore I need to make a different decision. Um, I think that's a really good point, because you hear that statement a lot. Sometimes the people with the best ideas are the quietest in the room. Yes. And I suppose what you must see is the, you know, how do we pull that out? How do we get those individuals to feel that they can contribute and, and have a culture where that's supported? Yeah, no, absolutely. And yeah, it's really interesting. You can take it another. Yeah, what we tend to find, and I think the research around mental toughness supports this, that generally the more senior you are in a business, the higher your mental toughness for a number of reasons. You've made it to higher positions. Yeah. Um, you know, as we go through life, we know that our mental toughness generally improves because life experiences, so forth. And, you know, the senior leaders tend to be older generally. But it's really interesting what happens. And I've seen this in a couple of teams where the senior leadership team are lower on a metric than the organization is on average. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think I talk about it in the book where I've got one organization where the senior leadership team are really low on goal yeah. orientation. Uh, and the rest of the business quite high. And as a consequence, when you speak to the senior leaders, they think everything's all right. When you talk to their people, they're like, oh, God, we never have clear direction. We're constantly changing the goals. We ne we set off on a project and we think we're aiming over here. And then they yeah. change it halfway through and they change direction. And it was really, really interesting delivering. I, I always remember I was delivering this back to the whole directorate. And uh, there's probably about 80 people in the room and I was taking them through the group scores and I grouped them by senior leadership, management, you know, uh, junior staff, the scores. And on that one, we'd, we'd always get a three, two, one, three would be the lowest on the scale, two in the middle, one, one would be mm. the highest on the scale. And on that one, it was a complete reversal. Mm. The junior staff were by far um, the highest on, on the goal orientation scale and then the middle managers and then the senior leadership. And there was silence in the room when that went up on the board. And eventually one of the senior leaders said, well, no, no, that's got to be wrong. That can't be right. Are you sure you got that right, Craig? Uh, and because I knew that was going to be a bit of a moment in the session, I, I'd spoken to the HR team and we'd use different metrics to mm -hmm. cross-reference that. 
And then when we looked at like 360 degree feedback on the senior leadership, it was turns like we're flip flopping on our strategy. We never have clear measures for success. So all the ancillary data around the mental toughness supported yeah. it. Um, so I shared that in that moment when I was being challenged that we'd done this kind of cross checking bit. And then, you know, actually all the all the junior staff started speaking up and going, no, no, that's how we feel. That, that's right. Mm-hmm. And, and there was a mm-hmm. real cultural shift in that moment in that room where there's like you could you could hear all the seniors leaders going, oh, wow, God, we'd have never thought that. Uh, and it was a really powerful moment. So, look, yeah, when you look at this at a team level, it does, you yeah, know, it's not a cultural measure, but it does give you some really nice little insights. Um, you know, and that organisation really took that on the chin and the senior leaders went off and actually built out some interventions so that when they were doing their strategic planning, when they were running team meetings, they actually built in uh, specific parts of their agenda where they would specifically focus on goals and clarity and, and making sure everybody was aligned. They took really proactive action to take that insight yeah. uh, and, and address what they'd identified to be one of their challenges, uh, which was really nice. Yeah. Yeah. If I may, I might ask you a slightly transcendental question, given I know some of your background and your introduction, you you talk about working for the charity and, and I know about your role currently in Silex. Yeah. How are you seeing it, this use of mental toughness with younger people? Um, how are you utilising or how might you use it for younger people and helping them understand the challenges that they may face or are coming at them? Yeah, I, yeah. L- listen, I think we live in a very different world to what we grew up in um, mm. and, and yeah that's hard for us as as adults as senior leaders in organizations as parents to try and understand the current reality for youngsters i yeah i i have two roles i guess in, in which i interact with youngsters so yes it's currently you know i'm running a legal institute that's got a law school attached to it mm-hmm. so you know we're one of the biggest law schools in the uk so we have a lot of young people coming through, particularly on apprenticeships, but also doing distance learning, which is a real challenge. Um, and, yeah, we're beginning to roll mental toughness out into that environment. In fact, literally the hour before this, I was running a one hour mindset uh, class session with our new apprentices that we're mm. just on onboarding at the moment. And I also teach at a university one day a week uh, in the business school. So, yeah, I see a lot of young people and, you know, I think what the mental toughness tells us and what research tells us from the mental toughness stuff is, look, we often think that young people need to build out their confidence. You know, as they go into the world of work, what's really important for them is to to build their confidence so that they can interact with their peers and their their senior leaders and, you know, contribute. And I think a lot of effort and energy is going into designing programs that build confidence. And I think, you know, one of the things I've taken from the research that's come out of mental toughness is maybe it's not the confidence they lack. Uh, it's commitment within the four C's, particularly focus, you know, because they've got so many digital inputs these days and so much information coming at them. Uh, they can probably process information. I have no research for this, but I, I suspect they process information much quicker and faster than we do. Yeah. Um, there's certainly the business context around it in the sense of they don't necessarily know what that information means in the commercial context or in that academic context. So they might not be as effective at filtering it as we are. Um, mm-hmm. But what they definitely are unable to do as effectively as as people of previous generations, I think, is it, focus. And I spend yeah. a lot of time when, when I'm running those kind of mindset sessions, talking to people about how do they increase that, improve their focus control? You know, how can they concentrate for longer? Um, you know, and, and and breaking their working day and and, and yeah, you know, their study time, you know, into sixty or ninety minute chunks. Look at the day as four ninety minute chunks. Um, you know, com- you know, commit yourself to that ninety minutes. Turn off your phone. Get rid of notifications. Close down your email. You know, try and get yourself into that psychological state of flow which is really, really efficient. Uh, one of the things I teach at universities, operations management, which all comes out in the manufacturing world. And you know, um, done work with organizations such as BA Systems in the past from a manufacturing point of view. Uh, and they'll be the first to tell you, as soon as you take an engineer off a job halfway through, their productivity and efficiency plummets. 
I, I spent a long time working in automotive. As soon as you took a mechanic off a job halfway through, your productivity and efficiency would plummet. And it's really interesting that in kind of business world and academic world, we haven't figured that out yet. As soon as you start to multitask, your productivity and your efficiency will plummet. Yeah. Um, you know, and actually, you know, if it, it, I tell people to work in four 90 minute trunks, two in the morning, two in the afternoon, and then fit email and everything else around that. They kind of, I, I always get the response. That's only um, three hours a day, Craig, an hour and a half in the morning. Uh, sorry, that's only six hours a day, Craig, not eight. Um, but, you know, I think you'd be far more productive if you did that. I think you get more than eight hours work out the door. So for young people, focus, control, Get them to focus, get them to turn notifications off. Um, and, and that's the best thing we can do for them. I think it's a really good point. It was a slightly loaded question, given that we're talking about culture and teams as well, in that I think what I've seen, having done some work with young people uh, with MTQ and also working for a children's charity, is is they often struggle with change, with that transition, going into yeah. sixth form, going to secondary school, going to that first job. And I, and I see that with teams sometimes, and in particular with poor recruitment is that you can you can have a perfectly formed, well-functioning team that's got a vacancy. You put the wrong person in there, you can completely and utterly demolish the uh, the culture, the the identity that that team has got. So I think where and, and an individual coming into a team that's very high performing is going to struggle. And you mentioned it before they're often quite quiet when they first join a team because they're trying to find their their space, they're trying to find their reasoning, their context of being in the team. So. I'm fascinated to hear how you see that and that commitment is is really critical, especially when you take people off a job, because we see that a lot, you know, these matrix teams, people come in, go out, come in, go out. And I think that has a significant effect on the overall effectiveness of the team. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I was interesting. So one of the things I was thinking about as you were talking about your piece and yeah, do you see a difference between, for example, a senior leadership that's a team that's ongoing, doesn't have a end date doesn't necessarily have a project deadline versus a project team and how the different mental toughness profiles might affect performance of those two teams or two types i think it's a really good question i think i'm going to answer the question by not answering it um (laughs) very often at board level you you don't see i think board board teams are often some of the, I'm going to use inverted commas here, some of the worst performing teams you can meet because there's a lot of jostling for position. There's a lot of people trying to make their space. And I don't think they're necessarily aligned collectively as a team and, you know, picking on your your cultural piece there and the work you've done. Often you need to start at the top because these leaders should be demonstrating and role modeling the best behaviors. So I, I think it's tricky. I think if you get in, and as you say, you know, people at the top tend to be more robust in terms of their mental toughness. And there's a very famous piece of work about the chief execs on the NASDAQ being almost, I think, 35% of them are, are clinical psychopaths. So <laughs> I think you have to be careful when you are on a board environment in terms of awareness of what the, the board are trying to do. And I think it takes a really good and strong chief exec or chair to bring the team together. Um mm-hmm. What I often see is, uh, and we and we've picked up on this in terms of overcommitment, is that people are just continuously running at something, throwing themselves wholeheartedly into stuff, but not taking the time to reflect and learn. Um, and so, one organisation I worked with, um, it was well known that their projects always overran in time and always overran on budget, and yet yeah. these were individuals who are incredibly strong on control and commitment. And they didn't take the time to reflect. And the one thing they could have done to learn, so in terms of that learning orientation, is to step back and go, right, what have we learned from what we've just done? Did it go well? What didn't go so well? And so you do often see teams with fairly low learning orientation, which I think is a really important thing to pick up on to go, we do need to reflect and review on how that's been going. And I think we're in a world now which is, seems to be speeding up, not slowing down. And I think that time to reflect or time to think, as Nancy Klein calls it, is getting harder. Um, yeah. And and yet it's probably one of the most important areas for a high-performing team, ideally a high-performing board, to do is to spend that time reflecting and reviewing. 
and having that moment where they have got that collective identity where they're working well together. So, yeah, it's interesting you picked on the on the board level to start off with because, yeah, sometimes you don't see great behaviour there, and I think I think individuals need to consider how they think and how they act at that level, and not have that jostling. That's not the way it would work ideally. Yeah, no, and, and the reason I picked up on it and picked on it is quite specific. I try not to work with clients where they kind of say, oh, look, we don't want to do it as a senior leadership team. This is for our teams. Start with the middle. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, that's just my work. That's my biggest red flag. Yeah. Because they think they're not the problem. We don't they, need it, they do. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And, um, you know, so, yeah, one of my prerequisites is always, no, we need to start with the senior leadership team because they will set the culture. And and it comes back to your one, your very first point around from the Cass Stewart stuff around, you know, you've got to operate within the system. Yeah, and it, I can try and fix the problems at the bottom of the organisation, but if the system above them isn't accepting or willing to change, then we're not going to make any traction at all, are we? Um, you know. No, and, and I think I think we've both got examples where we've worked hard with middle leadership teams, and it's had little effect because up above nothing has changed, and you you do hear that in one to ones with with managers going, well, nothing's changed, it's coming down. We're doing our best here, so yeah, I think you're spot on in terms of culture. And high-performing teams, clearly they go hand in hand, is is you do need to at least look at what's happening at the top and and address issues or areas of concern. E- equally, it might be going well. So uh, we're not here to pick fault. It's more about you know, what's going to have the most impact. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Listen, mindful of time. Um, so any final thoughts or reflections that uh, you want to share? No, I, th- I think just personal point of view uh, with you, Craig, it's been, a, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. I know we talked briefly the day before and we said, oh, we could talk for hours at this rate. Yeah. I think what, what I really like about your chapter is is the practicality. Here's the examples. Here's what's happened. Here's what I've done. And, and I think that's so important is to give it context and narrative. As we'd say, tell the story. And I think what, what you've done is really put it in a really good, clear way to, for people to go, okay, I can see how the two concepts of of culture and mental toughness really do join together and give us a steer about where we could work. So I know I just wanted to say I was really enjoyed reading the, the chapter. Yeah, no, no, no. And ditto. I mean, what what I really enjoyed about your session or your chapter is the fact that you've given a really practical toolkit. And this is how you do it, guys. So it's not all concepts, it's not all theory. You know, here's the practical tool. Uh, and as we talked about briefly yesterday the other, the other thing i like is you've overlaid concepts uh you know we, we spoke about this yesterday didn't we that there's yeah there's a million books out there on leadership but at the core there's probably four yeah. or five key principles that underpin them all the world doesn't need another theory it needs practicality and that's what happens absolutely yeah and, you know I, I, in my leadership sessions we often talk about principles which is great and everybody loves them but then they're a bit like how do we do that craig and as soon as you give them the tool yeah try this there's that ah right now i get the the principle craig so no that, that that's a lovely essence of your chapter absolutely fantastic well it's been a pleasure talking to you craig likewise good stuff thanks dave